right, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for spending your Wednesday evening with us. I'm Tishan Lynch, Associate Professor of Orthopedic Surgery here at Columbia University and Director of the Center of Athletic Hip Injuries and Hip Preservation. And I'm honored to uh, lead this esteemed group here this evening, uh, talking about preserving your hip mobility, part of our Keeping Moving webinar series. Uh, this evening, we have a, a nice uh, series of talks that kind of give a sense of the spectrum of uh, the patient as they go through uh, the, uh, their potential uh, course of treatment uh, for hip injuries. Uh, we're going to lead things off with Dr. Romel Dolar, one of our sports physical therapists in Midtown, who's going to be talking about uh, pro of uh, physical therapy, uh, followed by Dr. Natasha Desai, one of our non-operative sports medicine specialists, who will be talking about the utilization of injections, especially biologics uh, for these injuries. Uh, I'll be talking uh, on hip arthroscopy if it is for everyone. And then we'll uh, bring it on home with Dr. Kubataka, who will be talking about hip preservation, and Dr. Alex Newworth, who will be talking about the anterior hip replacement. So without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get started, and we'll have Dr. Romel Dolar uh, uh, load up his, uh, his screen, and he's going to be talking about physical therapy for the patient with hip pain. Uh, take it away, Romel. All right. Thank you, guys. Uh, thanks again for joining me. Just give me a second to get this started. All right. Are you guys able to see it? All right, awesome. So thanks again for joining us. So I'm here to talk to you about physical therapy and how it could potentially help with your hip pain. So typically what happens is when you guys have hip pain, you see one of our physicians, uh, you get examined and your condition gets diagnosed with any one of these uh, common diagnoses. It could be some form of tendonitis, bursitis, impingement. And one of the first lines of defense is usually PT. So you get a general script that is essentially a set of guidelines for us to follow to help to treat your condition. And a lot of times when patients come in, they ask you know, how doing some type of stretching or getting a massage can help to address their pain. So what I like to, 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 tell, to tell them is that you know, instead of focusing on a specific diagnosis, we like to instead focus on the person as a whole to see how the entire musculoskeletal system could potentially be contributing to your condition. And then we like to get a little bit more information about you, what you do on a daily basis, what your extracurricular activities are, to essentially get a, a clear idea of, of what aspect of your life is most affected by your pain. And then more importantly, we like to talk about your goals and your expectations so that they can be managed accordingly. Now, moving on to the exam portion, something as simple as just watching a patient walk, we surprisingly get a good amount of information just from that. And something that you guys can try on your own is to just stand in front of a mirror balance on one leg and number one, see if you can hold that for at least 15, 20 seconds. You can do it equally in both sides and if you can keep your pelvis and your shoulders level throughout the entire time. Another common movement that we would take a look at is something as common as a squat. So from a front view, we would see if there's any excessive or decreased movement at the front ankle, if one is able to maintain adequate space between the knees or they, do they tend to collapse in. And from a side view, this is a, a good example of a patient having excessive hinging at the hip joint. And you can pretty much imagine how large of a compressive force they can apply on the hips. If a patient does this with increased weight and does that repeatedly, it can pretty much leads to, to increase hip pain and discomfort. So that's something that we would try to address or figure out why that is. Is it because of a faulty movement pattern? Is it because of muscle weakness or decreased mobility? So we would take a look at the range of motion from the joints at the foot and ankle to the hips all the way up to the spine. We took a look at how well the joints themselves moves where essentially you can have normal joint play, you can have excessive or you can have decreased joint play. So just to make it straightforward, if you have excessive joint play, let's say at the hips, would focus the treatment on a lot of strength and conditioning to take up the slack with the dynamic stabilizers. And if you have decreased joint play where it's affecting the way that you move, then we'd focus more on hands-on work to try to get that to, to move and glide a little bit better. We'd take a, look, take a look at the flexibility of a few major muscle groups. We'd take a look at, we would take a look at your strength. We use this little handheld gadget called the dynamometer where the harder you push into it, the higher number it registers. So it gives us a pretty good idea if there's any difference between left and right. Um, so after doing a few of those things, we, we get a, a much better idea or clear picture as far as what needs to be addressed in PT. And as far as manual therapy goes, it's gotten popular over the years, the use of various tools, such as these metal scraping instruments. It's a cupping made famous by this pretty well-known Olympian, so various forms of massage guns. And then there's the good old fashioned hands-on work where you can apply pressure directly to a sensitive muscle to try to get it to be less painful, or to just apply pressure directly to a joint, performing a joint mobilization to try to get it to move better. And in terms of strengthening goes, there's just so many things that can be done to work on strengthening the hip and core. So what makes it fun for me is to try to figure out the right combination and the right dosage as far as what's appropriate for one patient to another. 
and uh, each exercise is easily modifiable. So just to give you an example of a commonly performed exercise, a bird dog here to your left and a single leg bridge to your right, um, you can easily do it uh, just by going through the movement, or it can also be done against a manual resistance, where here on the left, we could focus on challenging stability. We could work on eccentric, concentric contractions, and then if somebody's able to hold the bird dog pretty well, we we'll just apply manual perturbations, and you can see here that it really doesn't take much to throw her off balance. And then education to an often understated aspect of physical therapy. I always encourage patients to ask lots of questions so you guys get a really good understanding of your condition and why we're doing what we're doing in, in physical therapy. And it also helps uh, for you guys to be more proactive in the, in the decision-making process here in rehab. And then pain. So unless you sustain a traumatic injury, not all pain is necessarily bad pain. So being familiar with what type of discomfort is okay to try to work through and what isn't uh, can also be pretty empowering and promote independence. So if in the event that physical therapy does not work, um, that's when Dr. Desai will discuss other options such as injections. The other three panelists will discuss surgical options, but more often than not, after these other forms of interventions, you'll most likely end up back in physical therapy while I'll be waiting for you in open arms. So uh, thanks again for your time. And any questions, please feel free to email me or ask in the Q&A section of the forum. Great, thanks so much, Romel. Um, while Dr. Desai is loading up uh, her images for the next talk, um, Romel, what would you say is when patients come in with hip pain, what is the one muscle group that you find that they are typically weak in and where you need to spend a lot of time, uh, um, at least in the first couple of visits, uh, trying to get them back up to a baseline strength? Yeah, usually the, the smaller, the, the neglected muscle groups of the hips, the, the hip abductors and the external rotators, these are the muscles that are deep in the hip joints, the ones that uh, don't really get to, to be seen, so they often are avoided if people do any kind of strengthening exercises. Um, so those, those are the, the more common muscle groups that usually needs to be addressed. Great. All right, well, we're gonna to transition to our next talk now. We have Dr. Natasha Desai. She's our Associate Chief of uh, Non-Operative Sports Medicine here at Columbia and also is one of the team physicians with Columbia University. And she's gonna be talking about the utilization of biologic injections for your hip uh, discomfort. So uh, please take it away. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you all for joining us tonight. I think uh, this is a great topic. It's one of my favorites. Um, all the different types of interventions we can do to help keep you moving um, with hip pain. Um, I have no disclosures. So I'm just gonna go over what biologics are, a general overview. This could be a very long lecture, um, but we're gonna keep it short and sweet and um, do a general overview, talk about some available options and uh, how they can be applied in the hip. Uh, so what are biologics? Biologics can, are, the term is used often, it's naturally de derived cellular products. Uh, the majority of these options are derived from your own tissues, but there are some off the shelf options, which I'll go over. But the biggest thing is that it's to facilitate healing and try to actually uh, target the injury rather than numb the pain. So what it's not, it's not an anti-inflammatory medication. It's not a pain medication. It's actually using naturally de derived treatment um, to promote growth and healing. So the, there's a lot of options. I, I'm just listing four and it seems a little bit like alphabet soup and I'll go over each one. But each op, these are the options that are the most common that you'll see. And these are ones that I've actually done myself. So I, I find uh, them to be the most available. There's a lot of options out there that I wouldn't necessarily recommend. So um, I'm just gonna go over these four. So the first is platelet-rich plasma or PRP, it's common, commonly called, and this is a simple blood draw. And then it's centrifuged and spun down and the platelets and the, the plasma, um, which separate out to the top are taken out and separated from the heavier uh, platelet cells or the red blood cells. And you see that it is a nice lip, liquid gold color and platelets are the the initiators of wound healing. And so concentrating that and injecting that into areas of injury or inflammation can actually provide the adequate environment and uh, factors to promote healing. The next is the most commonly available off the shelf option. And this is dehydratic, 
dehydrated uh, amniotic membrane. And that is actually um, the membrane and the fluid that surrounds embryos. And when um, the C-sections um, are had, they actually take the, take the embryonic fluid and membrane, dehydrate it, decellularize it, and create a powder. And that can, powder can be stored on the shelf, reconstituted uh, with fluid, and then injected into uh, in areas of injury. And all those natural healing uh, and growth factors that are surround the embryo actually can be used to promote your own tissue healing. And then there's the ever so popular stem cells. It's not true stem cells. These are not embryonic stem cells, um, but they're mesenchymal stem, stem cells. So they still have the potential to differentiate and stimulate um, tissue growth. Um, and there's two different ways that we, we harvest these stem cells in the US. The first one is through uh, adipose derived, meaning a small volume liposuction. It's not a, not a big volume liposuction, but a small volume li liposuction or actually a um, bone marrow aspiration. And that fluid that's aspirated either through the lipo aspirate or the bone marrow aspirate is then processed right there in the room because that through uh, federal regulations, we are not allowed to culture or, um, or process these anywhere outside of the room. They create like a very fatty um, lipo aspirate or bone marrow aspirate that then is injected into uh, the joint. So the applications in the hip are um, plentiful. The big thing to know is that hip joint comes along with lots of uh, pain generators. Just if you have hip arthritis or hip impingement, that doesn't mean that the hip joint is the only uh, generator of pain. The hip joint is enveloped in muscle. And um, they, when one part, the, mainly the hip joint is causing uh, pain, the other parts tend to take over. And so you could have pain generators on the trochanter, which a lot of people have hip pain on the side of their hip or in the center where the adductors are, um, are attaching and that could create a lot of tendonitis or, or pubic symphysis pain. Um, and then also the hip flexor, a lot of people get hip flexor pain and um, all these areas are potential areas of intervention and uh, potential areas of uh, treatment. So the key points are that uh, Biologics are not quick fixes. They're not a quick steroid injection to help with pain to get you through the weekend. They're not, um, it's not a, uh, you know, Band-Aid. It's the, I always tell my patients, it's a investment in time and money and that you are um, putting your efforts into try to heal the tissue. Um, and it takes time because we're augmenting your own body's ability to heal. Um, biologics can ha have a great role in pain control. There's been multiple studies that have shown, especially in tendinopathy, but even in joints, um, shown that it helps with pain control and long-term pain control better than steroid injections in many cases. Um, it can aid in injury healing, especially in tendon-related issues, and it possibly can slow progression, but those um, those things um, need to be shown further in, in um long-term studies. Um, and the biggest thing is that the treatment can be tailored to the patient. So coming in for a consultation, there's a lot of different options, um, as I mentioned, and there's risks and benefits um, and, and different options for each patient. So this is truly personalized medicine and it's something that uh, we can discuss. And thank you. And this is my daughter, Summer, who's showing her great hip mobility. <laughs> Great, thanks so much, Dr. Desai. Uh, it looks like we got a couple questions for you in the Q&A section and it's maybe in the chat. Um, so we'll give you a quick breather here and if you wanna jump into those. And now I'm gonna transition and we're gonna be talking about hip arthroscopy, is it for everyone? Here are my disclosures, none of which are relevant to the content of this talk. So in a short, simple answer, no. So 
uh, let's, uh, let's take a step back before we start talking about who it is for, but what does it exactly treat? So what it treats is hip impingement. Um, and hip impingement, otherwise known as femoral acetabular impingement, is when you have an extra bump of bone that's either coming off of your femur, as you see here, which can bump into your, your acetabulum or your socket. And on the video on your right, you can see as that bump bangs into the socket, it can cause the labrum to displace and move upwards and can cause shearing of the articular cartilage. And the reason why we care about this is that uh, hip impingement can lead to label tears, which could predispose the patient to osteoarthritis. And when we look at this here, this is what's called a pincer lesion, where you have an extra bump coming off of the socket here, and it can cause the labrum to get pinched in between and can reproduce that same pain. Now, if you look at this video on the right, essentially what we're trying to do is get a square peg to fit into a round hole. And unlike this small child right here, we don't have any workarounds where we can just lift up the lid and, and drop it in. Now, let's talk about how this presents. Typically, these, uh, typically patients with uh, hip pain because of a label tear will talk about pain coming from the front of their hip. They'll talk about it in their groin crease. Uh, a small percentage of the time, they might have some lateral or side-based pain. Another way that the uh, patients will describe pain is that they'll have it in a C-shaped distribution. So they'll take their hand, put it uh, into the letter C, and then wrap it around your hips, as you see right there, and uh, we'll describe the pain as deep between their fingers. Typically, we'll have sharp pain with deep hip flexion or trying to bring their leg across their body. They'll have pain with activities of daily living, such as sitting for long periods of time, trying to put on their socks and shoes, or trying to get into pants, or having pain with deep, uh, with deep squats or lateral cutting activities. Now, how exactly do we treat this? We've done a great job of going through our non-operative measures of rest, anti-inflammatories, physical therapy, and injections. And this is our protocol here that we utilize at Columbia that we wrote up uh, a couple of years ago uh, in the Journal of the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. Uh, we always try to lead off with non-surgical treatment and then consider the, uh, the role of injections before we start talking about surgical intervention. Now, when patients ask me uh, how successful can conservative care be for this, we break up our non-operative care into two main, two main phases. Uh, first being activity modification and physical therapy. Uh, the second phase being the utilization of intraarticular injections. And then the third phase being the need for surgical intervention. And looking at the success rate, uh, trying to get through those first two phases, I typically tell patients it's less, a little less than 50% that we'll be able to get them better uh, with, uh, with non-surgical care. And then uh, those that need to have surgical intervention just over 50%. So let's talk about who the ideal candidate is. Uh, that, that's always uh, the million dollar question. And uh, a few years ago, I led a group of hip arthroscopy surgeons across the country uh, from 14 different institutions where we put together some best practice guidelines for the use of hip arthroscopy uh, for femoral acetabular impingement. And what we did is we put together a checklist uh, looking at preoperative recommendations, intraoperative practices, uh, as well as postoperative protocols. And within that, we came up with 27 recommendations. And within those, we uh, described who the ideal patient is. Those who have exhausted non-operative care, are not taking a uh, narcotic medication as has been found to have a uh, effect on their outcomes. Those who have responded well to an injection, uh, age is not a factor. Uh, we care more about looking at the joint space on the plane radiograph. So we don't wanna have uh, patients that have arthritis or uh, individuals who have dysplasia and Dr. Taka and Dr. Newarth will go into more detail regarding that. And not all labral tears are the same. So these three patients right here, have all been di diagnosed with labral tears, each with very different underlying bony pathology. The picture on your upper left is an individual who has hip impingement, which you can see here. This middle picture is hip dysplasia, which Dr. Taka will go into more detail on. And here you can see an individual with bone on bone arthritis. So all have labral tears, but uh, bony morphology, which changes the, uh, the symptomatology of their labrum tears. And they all get three very different treatment options. Now, uh, before I leave, Let's take a quick field trip to the operating room so we can see what it looks like when we get into the hip. So essentially hip arthroscopy is a keyhole surgery in which we make three small, uh, small incisions about the size of my ring nail around the hip. And what we're able to do is we're able to put the, the camera inside of her hip and we're able to take a look at the ball as well as the socket. As you can see here, as I'm pushing down on the labrum, which is this uh, thick twizzler looking structure, there's some dancing of the articular cartilage and we call this the wave sign. So this is the tear that we're talking about. And just above the tear, as we're lifting up on the ligament, uh, laying across the front of the hip, there's this, uh, this bump of bone called a pincer lesion, which is causing the labrum to get pinched. And we can also see that there's a little bit of red uh, bruising right here along the labrum, which can also contribute to the pain. So we come in with a, um, a, a bird device that allows for us to shave down this extra bump of bone, and we're able to get it up and out of the way so that it's no longer gonna be causing impingement on the patient. 
And then what we do is we drill and we place suture anchors, uh, um, place suture around the labrum and we're able to refix the labrum uh, back onto the acetabulum. Here on this uh, video right here, this is when we're done. This is a nice uh, anchor repair. The ball goes back into the socket. We're able to maintain the suction seal, which is an important function of the hip joint. And then when we're done, we turn our attention to looking at the femoral head. These are looking at the blood vessels here. This extra bump of bone is right in this area is the cam lesion, which is coming, which is the square peg portion. And again, these are the blood vessels on the top. We're removing this fibrocartilage. And again, we can look at this bone a little bit clo closer. And then we come in with our burr and we reshape, we recontour, we make that square peg into a round peg. And as you can see here, we now have a nice concavity of our uh, anterior femoral neck where we had this previous bump that was present before. So this is looking at our x-ray as we have now reshaped our femoral neck. We've made that square peg round. And then this is looking at our post-operative protocol here. Just some timelines for patients. I typically will say that the recovery is about five to six months in terms of getting you back to your full, activity, uh, full athletic activity, although the recovery can take up to 12 months. Patients uh, start physical therapy the day after surgery. They are able to bear weight in a foot flat uh, with crutches fashion. Uh, they can start getting onto the stationary bike the day after surgery as well too. Uh, the elliptical, uh, I'm sorry, our pool aquatic program comes in around four weeks, elliptical at six weeks, a return to running at 12 weeks. And then we have our functional sports activities that get back into about the 14 to 16 month mark. So you can see that this is uh, quite the thorough program that we've put together that is quite progressive uh, in order to make sure that we keep our, uh, our patients and our athletes engaged uh, throughout the whole time. So here are our final thoughts. You know, patients can lead us down the path of righteousness in terms of where their pain's coming from. Not every labral tear needs to have surgery. Not every labral tear needs a hip arthroscopy and not all labral tears are the same. Um, so without, uh, um, and so with that, uh, we're gonna transition to uh, Dr. Taka, who's gonna be talking about hip preservation. Thank you so much. Uh... Tishan for talking to us about uh, arthroscopy. Now we'll be moving on to dysplasia. Let me just share my screen. So thank you everyone for uh, joining us tonight. Uh, we're talking about a topic that I'm very passionate about, and we all are here at the Hip Preservation Center at Columbia University. Um, so today we'll be talking about hip preservation surgery. As we've been hearing a lot tonight about the hip, uh, we know that it's a ball and a socket joint. And that's very important to understand because in order for a hip to be functional, it has to have a truly and completely round hip and a round socket, and they need to fit together like a lock and the key, and that's a lot of the things that Dr. Lynch was showing us earlier. Um, so it's common for patients to come in with hip pain and, and they go through the various uh, non-operative managements, and oftentimes uh, they have to go on to uh, a surgical uh, treatment. So we always want to figure out whether you're going to be a type of patient that can go on to long old age and be active like the runners down there in the bottom right or whether we can do a hip preservation surgery like we can see in the bottom left or ultimately some patients require a hip replacement which Dr. Neuwirth will discuss after me. At the Hip Preservation Center we've worked incredibly hard to put together a multidisciplinary team uh, to take care of hip problems and um, what multiple multiple <laughs> multidisciplinary means is that we have actually quite a variety of different providers. As you can see here tonight, uh, we even have radiologists that aren't speaking tonight that help us, that we work with together constantly to help diagnose these issues. And we truly work as a team in order to, to manage patients. So our focus today will be hip dysplasia. And as we heard, you can have problems in various parts of the hip, whether it's in the muscles, the ligaments, the tendons, or in parts of the bone. In this case, uh, we'll be focusing on the socket side of the hip. So what's the problem in hip dysplasia? So on the left side of the screen, we can see a normal hip. And there you can see that blue ball, that's the femoral head on the left side is completely covered and it's very happily inside a nice spherical socket. If we look to the right side of the screen, we can see that the ball is not inside the socket and it's coming out and 
that creates a variety of problems. So what that shallow hip does, we can see that golf tee, it's, it's barely supporting that, that golf ball. And that's what a shallow hip is like. I like to compare it to an unbalanced tire on a car. And we all know that if a tire on, the, on your car is not even, then it can wear actually on one side and it can wear out prematurely, even though some of the tire is still perfectly fine. We have to go on and change the tire, which is what we're trying to avoid with hip preservation. So what's the solution? In 1988 in Bern, Switzerland, the Swiss came up with a very elegant technique to, to treat this problem. And this was a surgical center uh, at this hospital in Insel Spital where I was able to train to learn this technique. And what this technique does is it reorients the acetabulum or the socket. That hat on this gentleman's head, on this gentleman's head is a representation of the socket with, the, with his head being the ball. And as we can see on the left side is a shallow socket on the right that has been shifted over. So here's another schematic showing what we do during a periacetabular osteotomy or PAO surgery. So on the left, again, we see a, a hip with dysplasia before the surgery. And on the right, we can see a hip with dysplasia after the surgery. And what the surgery entails is doing several osteotomies or cuts of the bone in order to be able to rearrange or reorient the position. So what we're doing is we're moving the socket around the ball. And that's what increases the surface area that covers the ball, which decreases the pressure on the patient's hip. Um, and we could see that the ball on the right is much better covered in under the socket. So why, why do we do a PAO? Uh, and that's to uh, preserve your hip, obviously, uh, cutting to the chase there. Um, but what are, what are really the underlying reasons and what does hip preservation mean? Um, we're trying to protect your cartilage. And by protecting your cartilage, we're ultimately delaying arthritis. The part of the surgery that I think is the most important to patients and definitely most important for me to address as a surgeon and as a doctor is to treat your pain relief. Um, it's an extremely effective surgery for treating pain. It improves the function because the ball is sitting better in the socket and it allows it to move more smoothly, which improves the mechanics of the hip. And lastly, the goal of any treatment that all of us here at the Hip Preservation Center are aiming for is to ultimately improve your quality of life. So now we'll talk about a few cases. Uh, here's a, a patient in her 40s. Uh, she's a long distance runner. She had actually bilateral hip pain. And unfortunately, the uh, injections and physical therapy were unsuccessful in treating her pain. And she was diagnosed with hip dysplasia in both of her hips. If we can look where the mouse is moving, we can see that that's the left hip where the, the socket is shallow. We could see that the ball is not fully covered. Um, and that's what we went ahead and did is address that issue for her with a periastabular osteotomy or PAO. Uh, here's the x-ray after the surgery. Well, we can see where the bone was cut. And we can see the three screws holding it in place. And we can see now on both sides, we, she has one side that hasn't been treated on, on her right side. Uh, where the ball is still coming out of the socket. And when we look at her left hip, we can see that the ball is very nicely under that socket roof uh, where it's being very evenly supported and distributing the pressure. Now, as we know, the problems patients can have can also be on the, on the ball side or the femoral side of the hip. And here's a teenage girl that I had treated recently as well. Uh, she was diagnosed with a childhood dysplasia an proximal femoral problem. And she was having groin pain that again was also unsuccessfully uh, treated and refractory to more conservative management such as physical therapy and injections. So for this patient, we went ahead and did two surgeries. First, we did a hip preservation surgery for proximal hip where we changed the angles and orientation of her proximal hip to better have the ball fit in the joint. And then after that surgery, we did a periastabular osteotomy where again, we were able to bring that socket to completely cover the hip. Um, going back to that slide, we can see how much of the ball is coming out of her hip joint and how well it's under that hip joint. Um, what's amazing about the periastabular osteotomy 
and why it's such a privilege to be able to do such an incredible procedure is the incredible success rate that we have with these surgeries. Patients have incredible pain relief for, for years with the majority of patients still having uh, their hip as many as 20 years after the surgery without having to go on to other procedures such as hip replacement, uh, which is something that uh, Dr. Newworth will be taking care of uh, that talk for us and telling us more about anterior hip replacement. So thank you. All right, uh, we're gonna transition here to Dr. Newarth, who's gonna be talking about the anterior hip replacement. This is uh, one of the newest fads in, the, uh, in hip replacement surgery. Uh, so tell us why we should be doing it uh, from the front in 2021. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you uh, for the opportunity here to talk. Um, so obviously, you know, hip replacement surgery has been around for quite some time, but it's changed significantly over the last several decades. And I'm going to talk a little bit about, again, what anterior hip replacement surgery means and what hip replacement surgery in general means in 2021. So first, we'll start talking a little bit again about what hip osteoarthritis means. As the prior speakers have mentioned, basically the hip is a ball and socket joint between articulating bones. Those bones are lined with a very precious, very special soft tissue called cartilage. Unfortunately, cartilage does not really um, heal and it degenerates over time in certain patients and eventually creates delaminations, areas of uh, where it's denuded um, and now bone is exposed and eventually um, you get full thickness defects and bone is rubbing on bone, which obviously is not ideal um, for pain-free range of motion. Um, when, when you present to our offices, you will certainly get a battery of x-rays, including x-rays of the pelvis and of the affected hip. And as you can see here on the left side, this shows the outline of the uh, thigh bone uh, at the hip, the proximal femur, and the acetabulum, which is the socket. And you can see on the left that there is a space, the you know, delineating between the ball and the socket, which is a space that's lined with cartilage. And unfortunately, when osteoarthritis develops, you'll see it can lead to what we see here on the right, which is what we call joint space narrowing. You can see now the two lines of the socket and of the ball are now touching, and the bone reacts by laying down more bone, by laying down denser bone, and eventually by creating cysts that fill with fluid. So why do patients develop this degenerative condition? Well, we don't necessarily always know. Osteoarthritis is the most prevalent reason for hip degeneration, most of which is idiopathic. We don't necessarily know exactly where it comes from. There are certainly anatomic risk factors, as the other terrific speakers mentioned, such as hip dysplasia and femoral acetabular impingement, labral tears. It can be post-traumatic if you break your hip. The hip cartilage may not heal. It can be after a bad hip infection as a child. It can be associated with certain lifestyle risk factors. It can be a result of avascular necrosis, meaning the blood supply to that bone is not good for a variety of reasons, including some medical conditions such as sickle cell or the use of corticosteroids can lead to this. And it can be autoimmune, such as patients with rheumatoid arthritis or lupus can develop this. The treatment options, they always start with conservative treatment options, which include weight loss and activity modification, physical therapy, anti-inflammatory medicines, injections, and eventually when all else fails, we talk about hip replacement surgery. Now the good news, while her surgery is scary, hip replacement surgery is considered to be the operation of the century. It's got extraordinarily high success rate. What is a hip replacement? A hip replacement is the procedure whereby one way or the other, we get into the hip joint and replace the lost cartilage in the socket with a shell in which an articular bearing surface is placed that can be made of plastic as it is here, or it can be made of ceramic or very, very rarely of metal. And then on the other side, on the thigh bone side, a ceramic or metal head and then a titanium stem is implanted into the femur. And that is what the four parts of a hip replacement are. Now, many of us know folks who've had hip replacements in the past. And I wouldn't presume what today's recovery is based on what the past recoveries have been. 35 years ago, the average length of stay was 21 days after a hip replacement and took about three months to re rehabilitate. 10 years ago, the average length of stay was about three days with six weeks of rehab. Today, in 2021, most hip replacements can either be done as ambulatory surgery at most one night stay with the discharge to home and not rehab. Often no physical therapy is even required and there are reduced complications and an earlier return to function. 
The typical recovery after hip replacement, the post-opera, of course, is you walk on the day of surgery immediately after your anesthesia wears off, you're able to go walk on your hip and the physical therapist at our hospital will walk with you. Typically, most of our patients are discharged to home on the day of surgery or the next day. Physical therapy will work with you while you're in the hospital to keep you up and moving and keep you walking. The recovery thereafter, most patients need a walker for a few days. Sometimes they even transition to a cane for a couple of weeks. At one month, you can expect to be about 80% of the way there, and at three months, about 95% recovered. Now, one common question is, what about my pain, pain management? So preoperatively, we want to lead to opioid detoxification. Using opioids preoperatively leads to worse outcomes after surgery. And we give preemptive analgesia or pain control with Tylenol anti-inflammatories and gabapentin. During the surgery, you get spinal anesthesia, and we inject a cocktail with corticosteroids and a variety of different medications to try to minimize the pain right after surgery. And postoperatively, we use a multimodal approach using Tylenol, anti-inflammatories, gabapentin, and some small scripts of opioid medications. Now, importantly, and this is why we're here, the approaches to hip replacement, there are many different ways to approach the hip joint for a hip replacement. Through the front with an anterior approach, through the back with a posterior approach and through the side, what's known as a lateral approach. And you can see here on the right, the different arrows showing you through the back, through the side, right through the muscle and through the front between the muscles. One of the major advantages of an anterior hip approach is it's minimally invasive with a small incision and goes between the muscles. It's intermuscular. There are no muscles that need to be cut to enter the hip joint. So why do we care about that? Well, first and foremost, Many folks who know people who've had hip replacement surgery through a posterior approach remember the dread, dreaded posterior hip precautions. You can't bend if you drop an object on the floor, can't cross your legs. It's quite cumbersome. None of that with your anterior hip replacement. It's also a precision operation. It's more precise when you do it through the front. You're laying on your back during the surgery. You can feel the bony landmarks, make sure the leg lengths are equal, make sure the hip is stable when we leave the operating room. We get to use intraoperative x-ray to make sure the pieces are exactly where we templated they would be before surgery. So we know what we leave the operating room with. So in summary, why anterior hip replacement? It's faster recovery, better pain control. We don't cut any muscles, so it hurts less. We use less narcotic pain medications. It's certainly more precise, less risk of dislocations, mean no hip precautions, okay? So a lot of folks will ask me, Am I a candidate for an anterior hip replacement? My answer is if you're a candidate for a hip replacement, you're certainly a candidate for an anterior hip replacement. All right, thank you. Great, thanks so much, Dr. North. Uh, we're gonna try to open up our videos here for a little discussion and, and Q&A here uh, until the end of the hour. Um, so, um, so Alex, uh, thanks for a great overview for the anterior hip replacement. I, I always tell patients that, you know, as a sports arthroscopic surgeon, you know, I like to think that I could do a lot of things, but the two most successful surgeries we have are hip replacement and knee replacement, and I don't do either one of those. So um, I always try to make it an easy sell for you guys, and, and you did a great job showing us that. Um, we'll, we'll come back to the, the anterior hip here in just one second. Um, I'd like to uh, pick uh, uh, Romel's brain here for a little bit uh, in terms of um, why uh, why physical therapy? So, you know, from the clinician side, I'll tell you that when I see an athlete or a patient who has hip pain and I'm recommending that we get them set up with physical therapy, um, patients some of the time uh, will put up a little bit of a fight. Uh, they'll, they'll hit me with uh, the response that they, they have a personal trainer, that they work out every day, that they uh, can go up and down stairs and they don't get tired. Fill in and fill in whatever blank you want. Um, can you, uh, can you provide an answer to the audience? You know, why is it that they should be coming in uh, to see you for physical therapy and what is it that you'll be doing differently than what uh, they do with their personal trainer? Yeah, sure. So I, I was really only able to, to give you just a brief overview of, of some of the things that we would look at um, during the initial evaluation, but with, let's say that specific example of, of that patient that you gave where they, you refer them to physical therapy, but they give you resistance saying they can do this, this, and that we would essentially try to figure out what's causing their pain in the first place. Is it something that's just specifically focused on that particular hip joint? Or like I mentioned earlier, is it something related to as low as the foot and ankle? Is it a weakness issue? Is it a decreased mobility um, or flexibility issue? And then depending on what we, uh, we find during the, the eval, we can more appropriately address it. Great, 
Um, Dr. Desai, we, we got a question here from, uh, from the gallery uh, on the role of orthobiologics for uh, muscle tissue or cartilage um, uh, injuries. Yeah, so there, what the overarching question is, what do you use it for? And I, and I, it's hard to say because the application is very vast. The question is, what is it best for? The best evidence is actually in tendon injuries, especially those chronic overuse tendon uh, tendonitis that there's actually scarring and calcifications and partial tearing and things like that. Um, the advanced techniques that we use with ultrasound and targeting the, um, the biologics directly into the tendon uh, helps kind of, and then debriding the tendon with the needle tip helps the whole tissue regeneration cascade. And um, the, the best evidence in literature is for tendinopathy. That being said, we use it in joints all the time, especially uh, hip joints where there's not a ton of other options um, in terms of non-operative options. Um, and I, I, we get great results. So I would say yes to tendon, yes to cartilage, yes to uh, labral tear and hip impingement. Uh, the only limited evidence is in muscle, in muscle um, tears, but muscle thankfully has very good blood supply and heals pretty well. So um, we're, we're good there. Let me, let me take a step back here. Um, I know we talked about the alphabet soup of orthobiologics, uh, but sometimes before even getting to the orthobiologic uh, bridge, so to speak, um, the, the utilization of cortisone. Uh, patients can sometimes be uh, a little uh, low leery um, in terms of its effects on cartilage. Uh, what it, can, can you provide to us you know, some of the education that you give patients as, as to why it's all right to proceed with a, a cortisone injection, whether it's someone who has a a uh, non-arthritic hip or an arthritic hip? Yeah, so cortisone injections are probably the most widely used injection. Um, and so that's why we have so much information about the potential downsides. What I'll say is that a single or maybe one or two cortisone injections is very, very safe. Uh, what we do know is that because cortisone uh, as, a, as a class is very powerful anti-inflammatory. It does temporarily inhibit the, uh, he, the infl inflammation cascade, which is part of the healing cascade. And there's a natural turnover of cells um, that happen. And if you're constantly injecting every three months, you're, you're inhibiting kind of indefinitely that turnover. Um, and so if you do repeated injections, that's where you get into trouble of weakening the tissue, weakening the cartilage, weakening um, the tendons. But a single injection used to kind of stopgap the pain and allow you to do really good uh, physical therapy as Ramel was discussing, um, or you know, for those patients that are just trying to get to next year where they could actually successfully do surgery because of social situations, there are definitely indications for cortisone injections in, in those cases. Okay. Great. And uh, just to, for the sake of completeness, you know, uh, with our non-arthritic hip population, uh, which is a sometimes can be a completely different uh, uh, several series of pain generators, uh, we'll sometimes utilize diagnostic lidocaine injections to help us tease out is the pain coming from the hip joint or is it coming from the back or is it coming from a sports hernia? Um, we'll transition here. We have a question uh, from the galley here, uh, and this is uh, for Dr. Taka in terms of uh, the need uh, for hip replacement after a hip arthroscopy. Um, and what are some of the reasons why and, and do you, in terms of the timing, when might you see that as well? So Dr. Taka. So uh, amazing thing about hip arthroscopy, it's such an effective surgery. Most of our patients are going back to pretty much all the activities they, they love. And I, I would think, and, and maybe Dr. Lynch, you could comment on this too. Uh, a lot of the reasons why patients go on to having a hip replacement after hip arthroscopy, when that does happen every once in a while, it's, it's simply because they're continuing to be active, use their hip and continuing to wear it out to the point where they develop arthritis. And as Dr. Neuwirth was discussing, our, the best solution for arthritis um, is a hip replacement through the anterior approach once the conservative management no longer works. Yeah, just to, just to piggyback off of that, I'll tell you that in the early days of hip arthroscopy, uh, when uh, some of the, the fathers of the field were, were trying to uh, navigate how to get into the hip joint, they first started with trying to remove you know, individuals who had loose bodies, and then they started doing hip arthroscopy on patients who had 
arthritis. And what they started to find that when they did this is that their patient, the patient's pain didn't get any better. So what we have found is that in patients uh, who have joint space less than two millimeters, so we, you know, what, as we talked about the the litany of x-rays that we get, we can get a whole bunch of different measurements. And if we measure that joint space to be less than two millimeters, that means that we're falling more into the arthritis category than the uh, patient who has pain because of an isolated label tear due to hip impingement. So that's at that point where we'll discuss the, the or where we'll move the conversation more to an arthroplasty as opposed to an arthroscopy in order to uh, ensure that the patient gets the appropriate care for the condition that they have. Um, uh, Dr. Newworth, uh, you know, in terms of uh, the, the different approaches uh, to the hip, it, it's been fascinating to see this evolution, uh, which has happened in, in quite the, the rapid time. I can remember when I was in training, uh, everything was done posteriorly. And now, at least here at Columbia, I, it's, almost, it's almost rare that someone's having a posterior hip replacement compared to the anterior hip. Um, do you find that you have patients who are uh, who are asking uh, about these precautions and, uh, and how do you uh, get them on board with uh, the anterior hip replacement? Thanks. Uh, you know, that's a great question. I mean, certainly everyone knows someone who's had a hip replacement. It's such a common operation now, especially with our, you know, more active uh, population, our aging population as well. So certainly most patients do ask about precautions. They'll say, well, look, my friend, somebody I know from temple or church can't cross their legs. They wear a pillow. They did all these things. They couldn't go skiing. And what I explained to them is that certainly the approach through the front entirely mitigates those problems. And so there are absolutely no hip precautions. And, and I reassure them based on the studies that have shown a much reduced risk of dislocation that's at least 10 times lower than through a posterior approach. Um, so, you know, obviously we're, we're trying to educate our patients. We're trying to educate um, the therapists out in the community who don't deal with a lot of anterior approach um, and, and our primary care providers to, to, to remind them that, that in 2021, an anterior hip does not require any sort of precaution whatsoever. Great. Uh, there, there's a question from the galley here on the role of dual mobility hip replacement. Let me, let me throw that to Dr. Taka here real quickly. Um, and then if you have anything else to add, uh, Dr. Newworth, I'd uh, love to get your thoughts. Yeah, um, there's a few questions here. Uh, we could start with uh, the dual mobility question. Uh, so, um, and actually it, it kind of is related to one of the other questions here, which is as a surgeon, I'm also a hip replacement surgeon and that's a surgery I do. Uh, every week, multiple times as well. As hip replacement surgeon, I, I would want the anterior approach. And uh, one of the, the tools or one of the issues with hip replacement, as Dr. Neuwirth talked about, is dislocation. Um, and that's largely been solved by, by anterior hip replacement because it's a, it's a tissue sparing, muscle sparing approach. We preserve all of your muscles. So all of the muscles that are holding your hip in place are not being cut like they used to be cut with all the previous approaches. On top of that, one of the most important things in doing a successful hip replacement, just like with the PAO that I discussed, is getting everything in the correct position so that the ball and the socket can really work together in harmony and, and have good function. And we are able to use x-ray and even computer guidance in some cases to get the ideal position, which eliminates some of the prior issues patients had with leg length issues where they would wake up and their leg would be a centimeter longer that doesn't happen anymore with the anterior approach. And to address the dual mobility question, dual mobility was a device that was developed to decrease dislocation rates. And luckily, because we have had such incredible success with the anterior approach, and basically our dislocation rate is as low as one in a thousand in some of the studies. And um, simply dual mobility is not a necessary tool because we're able to improve the stability of the hip purely with the surgical approach and our technique alone. We don't have to rely on mechanical constructs and devices to improve that stability, um, which in ultimately I think creates a, a longer living hip um, than one that relies on mechanical constructs like a dual mobility uh, construct to, to function. I think uh, I, I totally agree, and, and I would add for, for for the audience, dual mobility basically means that there uh, there are basically two heads, two balls, uh, 
we don't have any pictures in, in our talk earlier. Um, and, and like you said, it obviously has been uh, developed to mitigate and reduce the risk of dislocation. And the role of dual mobility now through an anterior approach is really in the patient with extraordinarily stiff spine and multiply fused spine where the spinal pelvic relationships have been altered. In that case, perhaps there's a role of dual mobility. It's a discussion I have with my patient. I also get additional hip imaging of sitting and standing um, pelvic x-rays on the, on the side of the patient lateral um, to see how much pelvic mobility there is relative to the spine. Um, it's, there's no free lunch, unfortunately. And dual mobility in a young patient, uh, because the ball has to be metal, there can be some corrosion that happens between the ball and the stem. And so, although not any recent studies have really shown a big problem with that, uh, that's a hypothetical concern. Um, and so while the idea of a reduced risk of dislocation seems appealing and we would think, well, why don't we use dual mobility on everyone? There are potential concerns down the pike uh, that come with, uh, with those types of implants and that's why they're not universally used in every patient. Great. Um, so uh, the, a quick, easy question here. Um, how long do hip replacements last? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, something that, that Alex talked about, and in addition to, as you can hear, the, the hip replacement has dramatically improved over the years. We've improved the pain control, the anesthesia, the technique, and one of the other biggest things that we've improved are the implants. And uh, the common implant that we use, as Dr. Neuwirth showed us, is this plastic bearing or the polyethylene liner. And in about the 2000, the year 2000, roughly, we changed to a improved version of this plastic liner called highly cross-linked polyethylene. And we used to say that these hips last about 15 to 25 years, roughly. Um, and the patients that have had this new uh, plastic put in, even as long as 20 years ago, their hips are appearing to work just fine. And even though no one's had this hip for longer than 20 years, in the lab it appears that some of these new liners may last as long as 60 years. Um, so it's a, it's a dramatic improvement in, in, in the longevity of the hip. And then let me, let me just, oh, go ahead, Alex. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I mean, I think that the, the current, you know, the current data really shows that these hips, uh, you know, if, if they're not over abused really uh, will, uh, will last a lifetime. I mean, the, the wear rates are, are really negligible. Yeah, so to that point right there, I'll tell you that when I'm educating patients and if it's someone that I, I don't think would be a good arthroscopy candidate and we're, we start talking about hip replacement, uh, one is, you know, we have to get, uh, we have to get the box of Kleenex because they're, they're disappointed that they don't get the, the sexy poke hole surgery. Although I try to balance that with the fact that they get probably a, a better outcome uh, with getting a hip replacement from an anterior hip perspective. But the question that always comes up is, you know, can they run on their hips? And I know it's very uh, dependent upon the surgeon uh, as to their threshold of how much high impact activity um, a patient can put onto their hips. And what are each of your guys' thoughts and parameters that you provide to the patient uh, for returning to sports? So uh, for me, the only limitation to high impact activities such as jumping, uh, playing basketball or tennis on a hard court uh, is uh, about six weeks to wait for your bone to grow into the prosthesis. Uh, most prostheses that we use allow your bone to grow into it. That process takes about six to eight weeks. During that time frame, I usually limit my patients a little bit in terms of high impact activities to try to make sure that they don't um, displace the prosthesis um, you know, until it's basically fused with the bone. Um, thereafter, I have no limitations whatsoever. Kubo, uh, anything uh, to offer? Yeah, I, uh, I agree with Dr. Newworth. The, uh, really the only limitations are um, any activity that would injure your native hip. So um, if you're, if you, we can allow patients to go back to skiing, to riding a bicycle, uh, doing yoga. Um, and if you fall off your bicycle and you, and you hurt yourself with a native hip, that could be enough to hurt your hip replacement as well. Um, so our limitations now due to the anterior approach, preserving our muscles and making the hip so stable and these newer implants being so much more functional and durable, uh, I think we've been able to really push the envelope with what patients are able to return to. And what about, um, and uh, uh, sorry, um, just looking at the question here. Um, what about those individuals who wanna get back to running marathons? Um, 
or uh, another subset of patients that we see a lot here are professional athletes who are trying to get back to their professional activities, uh, more in the role of resurfacing. Uh, for hip resurfacing? Yeah. Um, you know, the hip resurfacing is a, a little bit of a controversial issue. Um, as, as Dr. Neuwirth alluded to, some of the joints can be metal on metal. And unfortunately, the metal on metal joints have been unsuccessful. The other issue that, um, and what happens with, just to clarify, the metal on metal is you can actually have a very catastrophic failure of the joint where you can even get have the muscles dissolve. And at that point, you have a very unstable hip because you don't have the muscles holding it in place. The other downside of uh, a um, hip resurfacing is typically it has to be done through the posterior approach. So what you're doing in order to do the surgeries, you're cutting all these muscles in order to get to the hip. So I know that a lot of surgeons say that it's a hip preserving surgery, but in the end, it's actually in a lot of ways more damaging than an anterior approach hip replacement. Lastly, it's billed as a hip preserving surgery, I mean, bone preserving surgery. And frankly, the, the bone, unfortunately, is being taken from the socket side on a hip resurfacing. And that's really, as, as a surgeon, in my opinion, the most crucial and valuable bone to preserve. I would much rather have a hip stem put in. And I think you can have, frankly, just as much function and activity from a well-done anterior hip replacement as from a hip resurfacing procedure. Yeah, yeah I agree. Uh, let, let's uh, jump back to uh, Ramel here real fast and let's talk about physical therapy. So um, in terms of your perspective of patients who come in after having a hip replacement versus those who have a hip arthroscopy, what are some of the, you know, the initial differences that, that you see and then just kind of, uh, kind of the, the 10,000 foot view in terms of the overall recovery? I, I, I have a sense of where you're going with this and it, it's probably not going to look good for me, uh, but, but I'm okay with that. Yeah, and, and yes, as, as you're probably expecting, the, the ones who... Uh, get the uh, the hip replacements. They they usually do really awesome uh, right after surgery. A lot of times, their symptoms or their issues can be managed via telehealth. Um, just uh, giving them an education and letting them know that exactly um, what the surgeon said that there are no hip precautions because a lot of times they're usually cautious or careful about how they move. And then also with walking, I just uh, thought of one patient who was using a walker at home, even though she didn't need to, just because she thought that that was the right thing to do. Um, so just educating them and letting them know that they can do a lot more uh, than what they think they can. And in terms of after an arthroscopy, um, usually with the, with the younger patients, um, a lot of times it's the first time undergoing something relatively traumatic or significant in their lives. And so they're, you know, in, in a lot of pain, they're very apprehensive to move and, you know, a lot pretty resistant to, to do some of the gentle movements or things that we do in PT. So the general recovery process, at least in the beginning for arthroscopy can be somewhat challenging and also just involves a lot of education and letting them know that it's, it's okay to do certain things. Great. Um, so we have a question here from the galley uh, talking about the, the role of injections for someone who has a, a label tear with FAI. And uh, I'll, I'll take this one. Um, so in terms of our, our lines of uh, injections for that patient population. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we'll sometimes utilize uh, diagnostic injections if we're trying to figure out where the main pain generator is. But if we have someone where we have a pretty good idea of where their pain is coming from, uh, in order to help them with their physical therapy, we can uh, utilize an ultrasound guided injection with a, a little bit of lidocaine as well as an anti-inflammatory uh, that basically the, uh, serves as kind of a fire extinguisher to calm down the inflammation within the hip joint. Because typically what can sometimes happen is when you have these label tears, you can have a lot of inflammation inside the hip joint, which can be exacerbated uh, by, by any type of physical activity or physical therapy. So this injection can uh, essentially be your fire extinguisher to spray out that, uh, that inflammation so that um, it can hit the reset button and uh, allow for you to start from uh, square zero so that when you are doing your physical therapy, you're not going to be limited because of pain. It can sometimes help you get over that hump, so to speak, uh, in terms of uh, pushing through with um, your physical therapy. So um, let me take a quick look here and see what else we have from a questions perspective. And then it uh, looks like uh, uh, Dr. Desai um, took on a question about looking at the role of uh, post-operative or, or continued pain after having bilateral hip replacements. Um, sometimes a potential uh, reaction to the, um, the, the cup in the, uh, the plastic sometimes can be overlying muscles and tendons. Uh, 
just uh, Dr. Taka, real quickly, what is kind of your, your 20 second algorithm to help manage uh, post-operative pain? And then we'll jump to Dr. Newworth. Um, you know, the post-operative pain actually begins before the surgery. Um, and that's something that, uh, you know, we discuss in the office. Uh, we have, as Dr. Newworth was describing, a multimodal pain regimen. So all of our patients are given prescriptions for their pain medications before surgery so that they have them when they go home the same day of surgery. Uh, before surgery, we have a, a medication cocktail, we call it, where we give a variety of medications for pain, nausea, uh, nerve pain. And then uh, during surgery, obviously, uh, Dr. Newworth and I, we practice a very careful tissue dissection and the surgery itself, the preserving the muscles is one of the best ways to prevent pain afterwards. Um, and then the pain uh, regimen that we have after surgery that you already have at home when waiting for you. So that's how we manage the pain. Um, but how about pain that is still, and for Dr. Newworth, how about pain that is still present, you know, let's say years after having a hip replacement? Yeah, certainly pain years after hip replacement is not normal. And, and I encourage patients to reach out to their surgeons, reach out to us anytime you have a painful hip replacement. We need to rule out bad things. Um, the first thing we will see us rule out always is an infection. An infection after a joint replacement does not present as the way you would think with a big, red, hot, swollen, painful fever uh, or anything like that. It can present really subtly with just chronic pain in the joint. So we'll always rule out an infection. And then obviously, we're going to rule out any sort of um, reaction to the prosthesis. We want to make sure the prosthesis is well fixed. So we'll get imaging studies such as CAT scans or MRIs. Um, but most commonly, it's a tendon irritation. Most commonly, it's something very benign we can work on with some physical therapy and anti-inflammatory medicines. But we always got to rule out infection, loosening, wear, and, and all, the, all the negative things. It's not normal to have a painful hip a year out. And Romel, we have a question here on the role of Tai Chi uh, for the, uh, after a total hip, uh, particularly an anterior total hip. Um, obviously, we hear a lot about yoga, Pilates. So what's your thoughts on this? I unfortunately cannot answer that well as I am not too familiar with Tai Chi. Okay. All right. Well, um, uh, well any... I can briefly take that question. No, uh, which is, um, you know, Tai Chi is, is a fantastic, you know, full body workout. Um, and we were asking about some of the limitations after uh, hip replacement surgery. They are extremely limited with the anterior approach. The one thing that I would say is Tai Chi falls into the martial arts category. And those are the one of the few things that, uh, things where you're involved kicking, where you're putting your leg in an awkward position and putting a lot of force through it is are one of the few things that can uh, injure a hip replacement. Sorry, just answering a question uh, for one of the patients, or I'm sorry, one of the, uh, the chat members. So, um, all right, guys, well, we're, we've come up upon our hour. We actually went over. Uh, so that's always a good sign of a good webinar. So uh, I want to be respectful of everyone's time here. Um, and thankful, thank you to our panel for uh, taking the time out of their busy schedules uh, to help talk to our patients here this evening. Um, there should be some follow-up information uh, sent out to you guys uh, in the next 24 hours. Uh, please feel free uh, to come see any one of us, uh, whether it's uh, for physical therapy needs, for injections, or just for an evaluation. We're always happy to see any hip uh, or, any, uh, or any injury for that matter. So uh, whether it's in the city, uh, in Northern New Jersey, or in Westchester, uh, we're here to help you. So thank you so much and have a great evening.